So next, let's talk about heart failure and the fact that ibuprofen and other non-steroidals worsen heart failure. So uh, the first question is then, what is heart failure? Which is an absolutely brilliant question and it's incredible how much phenomenally interesting ground we are covering just in a simple video on ibuprofen. So heart failure is a complicated topic and it's a topic that I in particular found very complicated when I first learned about it in medical school. It took me a long time to understand it and I would say only once I actually became a doctor did I properly understand what heart failure is. So I'm going to try and share that understanding uh, with you here. So let me tell you a story. So let's say we have a 65, in fact, let's make him a little older. Let's make him 70 year old man who has got ischemic heart disease. So let's say he was a smoker. He was a little bit overweight. Uh, his blood cholesterol was too high. His blood pressure was too high. Maybe he had a bit of undiagnosed um, mild diabetes because of his uh, high BMI. All of these things counted against him, caused atherosclerosis of his coronary arteries, and he developed ischemic heart disease. And let's say that individual has had a major heart attack. So thrombosis occurred one day, he got incredible pain. Luckily for him, it didn't result in an immediate fatal arrhythmia. He survived it. Uh, but then one of the major consequences that can follow having a heart attack is something called heart failure. And heart failure is when you start to swell up. It's when you start to become fluid overloaded because of problems with the heart. And not just can heart attacks cause this, but loads of different diseases of the heart, valvular diseases of the heart, arrhythmias of the heart, things like atrial fibrillation. Just having high blood pressure and continued cardiac strain because of the high blood pressure, that can lead to heart failure. So loads of different diseases of the heart can lead to this condition called heart failure. And as I say, it means it's the condition of having your body overloaded with fluid because of a problem with the heart. Fluid overload is the key thing that makes this diagnosis of heart failure. And if you've never seen what happens in fluid overload, I do advise you to Google pictures of it. People literally swell up. They end up with far too much water in their body. It ends up in all of their limbs and they become really edematous. And you can sort of poke your finger into their swollen legs and it will sort of leave a massive great pit that gradually comes back up. That's called pitting edema. So people end up very edematous from fluid overload. Also, it ends up in other tissues of the body. So, of course, the lungs are basically air-filled, really soft tissue. They're like sponges, effectively. So fluid ends up filling the lungs. And this is a condition called pulmonary edema. And this makes people really, really breathless when they become fluid overloaded. And it can cause severe problems with breathing because, of course, if the lungs become full of fluid, they're not going to be very good at exchanging gases. So it can lead to respiratory failure. So it is really dangerous, potentially, fluid overload because of its ability to stop the lungs from working properly. So the old name for people with heart failure was we would say they had a condition called dropsy. Now, this is not a name that's still used clinically. You would never uh, say that the patient has got dropsy. Uh, but this was the name that people used to use to describe these people who were blown up like balloons from this edema. And generally, most of the fluid ends up in the fat tissue. And... A lot of people will have it mildly, and it might be the case that it hasn't got so bad that it's actually pitting yet. Um, the way you can tell is if you feel the patient's fat tissue when they've got mild edema, it feels sort of hard. Whereas, of course, when you're young and you don't have any edema, the fat tissue is really soft. So I really do advise you know, to any medical students or junior doctors who struggle with heart failure, do feel what your own fat tissue feels like and then feel what the fat tissue of patients with edema feels like. And you'll notice that their t fat tissue is much harder in mild cases of edema. In severe cases of edema, it's much more obvious. Of course, it's pitting. You put your finger in and it makes a pit because there's so much fluid in the fat tissue. But in milder cases, it can be more difficult initially to understand what it people are talking about when they say this patient is edematous uh, and you need to feel their fat tissue and you'll feel that it's much harder because of all the fluid that's in their fat tissue uh, that isn't in a young person who doesn't have any problems with edema's fat tissue.
So why does this happen? Well, the full answer, no one yet knows. But what we do know is that when people have problems with the heart, diseases of the heart, it somehow leads to strange activity within the kidneys. The kidneys respond to that very strangely and they start to retain salt. And the retention of salt leads to the retention of water. And this is a key point in understanding this, that you need to think of it as a salt retention rather than as a water retention. So a key phrase from physiology class is that water follows salt. So let me just explain this in a little bit more detail. So if you take someone, let's take me, a 20-something year old male, when I drink a glass of water, that water gets absorbed by my gastrointestinal tract, but that water is going to be peed out really quickly because that is just water. You can't keep hold of that water. The body can't say, I'm going to keep that water, because if it did, that water would dilute the blood and the extracellular fluid and would lead to um, the concentration of sodium within the blood going down and that would lead to electrical chaos all over the body. So you have to control the concentration of the electrolytes in the blood and the extracellular fluid. And remember the blood and extracellular fluid are in continuum with one another. So the concentration of all the electrolytes in the blood is the same as in the extracellular fluid. So you can't just keep water. It would dilute all the electrolytes and lead to electrical chaos. So when I drink water and it gets absorbed, you then have to pee that out. And the kidneys have no trouble just peeing out water. They make nice dilute urine. If you want to retain water, you need to take lots of salt with that water. So of course, salt is going to be in the food we eat. So when I eat and I drink at the same time, the food that I eat brings the salt in, the salt's going to be absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract, and of course that salt will replace the salt that I've lost from sweating, etc. Uh, but a huge amount of it will then be excreted also in the urine, the bits that I don't need to stop me getting too high concentration of electrolytes in my body. Now, if the kidneys don't get rid of some of that salt, then it will keep that salt, but it will keep it with water so that it hasn't disturbed the concentration of electrolytes within the body. So remember, electrolyte concentration takes precedent. You cannot keep something that's going to disturb the electrolyte concentrations. You have to keep, if you're going to keep salt, you have to keep water with it as well. Now, the kidneys have a harder time getting rid of salt than just water. If you drink a glass of water, it will get rid of that water really easily. Anyone's kidneys can manage that. Easy peasy. Getting rid of salt is much harder work for the kidneys. So if you eat a really salty meal, it's more difficult for the kidneys to get rid of that salt. It takes a longer amount of time to get rid of it. So for a while, whilst that salt's waiting to be got rid of, it will be held onto. But to hold onto it and not disturb electrolyte concentrations, it has to also hold onto water to have that salt dissolved in that water. So temporarily, your body volume will increase whilst you're waiting to get rid of that salt. And then in, in people with heart failure, it appears that the kidneys then have an even tougher time getting rid of the salt and they then end up retaining the salt with the water that it's dissolved in and the people become fluid overloaded. And in fact, a way of making yourself edematous, and if you're young and healthy, you won't be able to make yourself badly edematous, but you will be able to make yourself more edematous, is eating more salt. So... Again, to stress, you cannot make yourself a Demetus just by drinking water. The way to make yourself a Demetus is by eating too much salt, because the salt is the bit that the kidneys find more difficult to get rid of than the water. And if it's going to keep the salt, the body has to have it dissolved in water, and that's how you become fluid overload. It did. So it's retention of salt that leads to fluid retention, not just retention of water, and that's really important to understand. So to summarise, in people with cardiac problems, for some reason, the kidneys respond to that heart problem by retaining more salt than they should. That salt is retained with water that it's dissolved in, and this can lead to them becoming extremely fluid overloaded. All of that salty water ends up in their legs and, God forbid, in their lungs.
So people with heart failure, they don't need to avoid water, they need to avoid salt. A low salt diet is really important in individuals with heart failure. And if you want to do an experiment on yourself and make yourself mildly edematous, one of the ways you can do it is by eating a huge amount of salt because salt is difficult for the kidneys to get rid of. And if you eat enough of it, even you, a young, healthy individual, will end up retaining that salt and will end up retaining salt with the water. So you might notice that your legs become a little bit swollen, or not your legs, your ankles most likely become a tiny bit swollen after a few days of doing a too salty diet. Now, thankfully, we do have treatments for heart failure. We have diuretic drugs such as furosemide, bumetanide, spironolactone that we give to people with heart failure. And these drugs work to stimulate the kidneys to get rid of salt and therefore they help to resolve this salt retention that's being caused by the cardiac problems. They help to resolve, therefore, the heart failure. Um, and it is truly absolutely incredible to watch these drugs work. So you start with a patient who's hugely blown up because of all of the fluid, huge diadematous, uh, and you put them on these drugs and then you give them to them for, let's say, a week. And gradually over the days as they're taking the drug and they take it every day, uh, you will watch them shrink as they gradually pee out all of the salt and with it all of the water. And it is absolutely amazing. It's one of the most amazing things I see in medicine, actually, uh, diureasing people with heart failure, because they literally can lose half of their body weight from all this water uh, with the salt uh, being peed out. So back now to ibuprofen. So certain of the prostaglandins are important in the kidneys. They're important for the normal functioning of the kidneys. And one of the things that they are doing in the kidneys is they're involved in excretion of salt and making sure that the right amount of salt is excreted by the kidneys. And actually, when you get rid of those prostaglandins, what ends up happening is the kidneys start retaining too much salt, i.e. it pushes you towards salt retention. Now, this is not clinically significant in an individual who isn't prone to salt retention already, i.e. in a young individual who doesn't have heart failure, you're not going to get a clinically significant change in the amount of salt that's being retained. They're not suddenly going to swell up to a huge size. However, in someone who has heart failure, you do not want to then be giving them a drug that further makes them more prone to retaining salt. Um, they might be on treatment for their heart failure. They might be on very well-controlled diuresis that is preventing them from becoming fluid overloaded. And then if you give them the ibuprofen, it might tip them back over and they might start retaining salt, retaining water and becoming overloaded despite their diuretics. So this is another contraindication to prescribing ibuprofen and indeed all the other non -steroidals. You do not want to prescribe them to individuals with heart failure because it will worsen the heart failure.